Again, welcome to everyone who's here. Maybe you're upstairs watching in the atrium. For those watching on YouTube, listening on podcasts, Facebook and Instagram, it is good to have you with us and may God bless you too. Um, about nine months ago, last summer, I shared a word and the word I shared last summer was called wind shift. We were looking at how the climate, even in Ireland, is changing. The summers are getting a bit warmer and there are vineyards growing grapes, even now planted along the south coast here in Ireland because that shift in temperature is allowing it under certain conditions. And we saw how first in the physical, then in the spiritual. And after the longest lockdown in Europe, if not the world, uh, during the pandemic, we noticed something beginning to shift last summer. And then since Christmas, many of us have noticed a big shift even more so. So I want to move from the big external thing to the personal. And today that shift is about what's going on inside of us. So I'm talking and today's message is called spiritual shift. And it's a bit like driving a car with gears, which is how we drive here in Ireland. Maybe today your gear stick is in neutral. Nothing going on. And you need to take that first step and put into first gear. I can remember my dad teaching me to drive. I remember I turned on the engine the first time. I was about 17. I turned on the engine. The car was in neutral. And then I had to push down the clutch and go into first gear. But you know what? When I turned on the engine, that's like you walking in here today. You might still be in neutral gear. But I believe before the day is out, before the hour is out, you'll have gone into first Amen. gear. Amen. Amen. You're, you've already started the engine. Mm. You're nearly there. Mm. Let's get closer to God. Maybe you're already in first gear. You need to go to second or to third or fourth or fifth. And now we've got sixth as well. Maybe some of us need to take that final shift and really allow God to use us. So that's what I'm looking at today. I'm going to dive in. I know time is against me. But we want to be here for God. We give God an extra bit of time. Are you okay with that? Are you starving for your dinner? Brilliant. Let's, let's be hungry for the word of God. Do you know what? You can get food all over the city or you have all evening long to eat. Let's feed our souls. Maybe God wants to nourish you. Here and now. So let's give him a little extra, even though we're running a bit late. I'm going to look at the book of Genesis, chapter 30, and the context here is a guy called Jacob, and he's one of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But um, he was a twin, and many of you know the story, but for some of you, it's all new. And this guy, Jacob, um, swindled his brother, his older brother, out of the family inheritance. And he had to run. And he had to go hiding for years. And now years later, he's, his brother asked to meet him. And he's bricking it. He's really frightening, frightened. He's sweating it. And he's going back to meet his brother. And he doesn't know, is his brother going to kill him? Is his brother going to beat him up? What's going to happen? So he's going back. And they're making the journey across the nation. Today we know it as Jordan. And he's going towards the nation we know of as Israel. And so he has now come to the River Jordan. And there's a load going on in his head. So that's where we're going to pick it up. If I can get this working, turn it on, Tom. Here we go. So this is God's word, Genesis 30. Jacob sent all his family, including his 11 children, my goodness, across the river. Then he was left alone, and a man fought with him there through the night. And when the man saw that Jacob was winning, he touched his hip socket, so that his hip was put out of joint while they fought. Then Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And the man replied, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. And then he blessed Jacob. So Jacob called that place Peniel, saying, I 
have seen the face of God and I have been delivered. And then the sun rose up and Jacob moved forward on his journey, limping because of his hip. May God bless his word to our souls. Amen. This is for us today symbolic. This is not talking about your physical hip. We're taught, we're, it's a metaphor, it's a symbol for our attitude, our lifestyle, our focus on life. So we're told straight away that Jacob sent all his family across the river, including his 11 children, and he was left alone. That's verse 23, if you're listening on podcast. Now, this is the last night that Jacob would have been east of the River Jordan. His family had gone into what today is known as the West Bank, or Judea and Samaria. But Jacob would spend his last night here. Now, this guy, it was never God's will that anyone would have more than one wife, but he had four. God, my goodness. <laughs> I know some of the men are going, I can't even handle one, not to my four. And the sisters are saying the same. <laughs> anyway, so he had four wives. He had 11 children, hello, and he also ran a very successful, I'm going to call it a business. Let me put it this way, Jacob wasn't bored. <laughs> Jacob wasn't just twiddling his thumbs. Jacob wasn't getting up in the morning going, how am I going to kill the day? What am I going to do with all this time? Jacob was a busy man. But now he had sent all his family across the Jordan, and he was, for the first time probably, alone. No God could move. Can I prophesy to someone here, you're too busy? Mm. And the stuff you're busy about is going to pass away. But the word of God endures forever. Amen. Get on your own with God. Leave the house. Turn off the phone. Get a couple of hours on your own with God. God will bless you. Amen. So Jacob was left alone. So here now Jacob is able to hear God. He's able to encounter uh, with God. And, you know, Jacob is afraid of Esau. And he's afraid of this thing coming up. And maybe you're afraid of something coming up. Maybe you're east of the River Jordan. And there's something coming up tomorrow. Or there's something coming up next week. And you don't know what's going to happen. And you've got a bit of anxiety. You've got a, a thing going on. And you know what, Jacob? could never overcome the issue with Esau until he overcame what was inside himself mm -hmm. first. Do you know the biggest enemy in my experience? It's ourselves. Yeah, yeah there's a devil. Yeah, the world. But you know, my biggest enemy is Tom Burke. I can't blame another pastor. I can't blame someone in the church. It's me. Yeah. I'm my own enemy. And if you're honest and you look in the mirror, you probably come to a similar conclusion. That's why we need God to help us conquer ourselves. And I'm not just talking about someone struggling with an addiction. I'm talking about everyone. So Jacob is left alone. And before he faces that thing, God had to conquer him. And God had to do something in him. We're told that a man fought with Jacob through the night. So this guy appears, this man appears, and the first thing we see here in verse 24 is that it was the other person, the man, initiated the fight, initiated the wrestle. Some versions call it wrestling. So this other person started it. So he is fighting with Jacob, not Jacob fighting with him. And it's going on through the night. So you know and I know, nighttime is another vibe altogether, hasn't it? At night you're on your own, usually. Even if you're married and your wife or husband is asleep next to you, you're on your own. It's dark. There's nothing happening. It really is you on your own. So here's Jacob at night and he's in this fight. Who was this man? Well, it's called a Christophany. That's the doctrinal term. It's a pre-incarnate appearance of the second person of the Trinity. Sometimes this person is called the angel of the Lord. It is in effect Jesus in the Old Testament. When God took on flesh and Jesus was born, it's called the incarnation. So pre means before. Before that happened, 
the second person of the Trinity, or the Godhead, would appear. And throughout the Old Testament, we see these, this happening. Very often, it's called the angel of the Lord. And while other angels like Gabriel or Michael wouldn't accept adoration, the angel of the Lord accepted adoration. So it's a Christophany. And actually, if you're really into the doctrine and the theology, you can see it in the New Testament as well, other than the 33 years that Jesus was on earth. After Jesus ascended to heaven, we have more Christophanies. Paul heard the voice of Jesus. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He had a Christophany. The guy who baptized him a couple of days later, Ananias, saw the Lord. He had a Christophany. Jesus had appeared. So this is an appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament. And Jesus starts the fight. Oh, Lord, I want you to be the gentle shepherd. Yeah, he is that. But he's also a fierce God who's jealous for your soul. And Jacob had stuff going on that shouldn't have been going on at all, at all. We're told when the man, when the Lord saw that Jacob was winning, he touched his hip socket so his hip was out of joint. Now, you could say, why was Jacob winning? Does that mean God is weak? No, this is recorded so that you and I, all these years later, we'll understand Jacob was a very strong personality. Some people are really strong and some aren't. Some people, I mean, anyone who's reared kids will know um, that you can have a, a son or a daughter who's really strong and they test you to the limit. But they're the very ones. If God gets their heart, they'll say no to the world and yes to God as well. But you can have other kids who will be very compliant and they don't give you too much trouble. The thing is, they'll be compliant to the world as well so it's very interesting to see how personalities get in there and how it evolves so this is telling us how Jacob was just so strong and what does God do he touches his hip he puts his hip out of joint does God wound yes he does but it always brings life you know, it says in the Old Testament, there is a, a weeping that leads to death, the weeping of despair. We're going to pray against that in a moment because at half past nine in our half past nine prayer and worship time here that everyone is welcome to, um, I knew very strongly that God wants us to pray against depression. Pray against depression. There is a depression that leads to death. It destroys. But there is a repentance. We may weep. But it brings life. So just because someone is crying doesn't mean it's wrong, doesn't mean it's bad. We can be weeping unto death or we can be weeping unto life. God touched his hip socket and now it was out of joint. Here's my question. There are wounds that are blessed. When God wounds us, it will always be for our good. Jacob walked with a limp. Are we walking with a limp today or do we strut? What do I mean by strut? Strut is where you're full of your own self-confidence. I did it. It's me. It's my talent. It's my hard work. It's my beautiful face, baby. It's my body. It's whatever. So are we strutting or are we limping? I love this from the very famous cartoon. It's very theological called The Simpsons, and here's something from that talking about strutting. Thank you, guys. There's only one thing to do at a moment like this. Strut. I'll play it again. There's only one thing to do at a moment like this. Strut. love that. There's a male strut and a female strut. I'm not going to attempt to do the female strut. I can barely do the male one. But you know what I mean. There's a, a place where our confidence, I'm all for self-confidence. We have to have a good self-image. We have to be comfortable in our own skin. Would you say amen? amen? But there's a line we cross where we become proud. And Jacob really had crossed that line. 
So if you really want to move on with God, God will take that and it'll do you good and it'll do me good. I love what the Prince of Preachers, 150 years ago in London, Charles Spurgeon said, we can conquer anything much in life until the Lord first fully conquers us. Amen. God has to fully conquer us. When I was a young Christian, 19 or 20, and I remember talking to an old pastor from up north, and I was asking him about becoming a pastor, and I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, God will only ever use a man or a woman who's broken. Not broken, destroyed, broken, humble. You see, if you have anyone in a pastoral role, and they're not broken in a good sense, you're probably going to deal with ego. You're probably going to deal with someone who will push people. You know, the shepherds in the Middle East would walk ahead and the sheep would follow. Shepherds here drive the sheep from behind. I've seen pastors drive people. Oh, no, no. No, let your own life be the example. Amen? Amen. And Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And Jesus said, come follow me. He didn't say, let me drive you. He didn't. He didn't. That's the world, it's particularly the Western world. But the Bible is a Middle Eastern book. We need to look at that. So if, if, you're, if you're, for example, a pastor and you're dealing with people who are vulnerable and you're all about your ego, you're gonna destroy those people. That's why it's so important that church is a safe place. Can I get an amen? amen? Church has to be a safe place. So we need God to conquer us. Actually, that guy Spurgeon, he knew what it was. He really suffered from depression. But God helped him through it. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, it goes on and it tells us in Genesis 32, 26, we're told Jacob said to the Lord, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Not until, unless you bless me. The blessing isn't definite. We have to ask. Mike opened with it. If we don't ask for blessing, will God really bless us? Ask him. Amen. Ask and you shall. Receive. Seek and you will. Bye. Knock and the door will. Amen. That's the Bible, just in case anyone is wondering. That's actually the Bible. It's good stuff. It's on you if you don't ask God to help, if you don't ask God to bless. Um, I love what one commentator said. He said, as soon as Jacob felt he was about to fall, and fall down he grasped the other man with a kind of death grip now in his weakness he will become strong and conquer but when he was strong in his own strength he had no blessing he had no blessing i love what the prophet hosea says elsewhere when looking on at this he said in Hosea 12, 3 to 4, In the womb, Jacob grabbed his brother by the heel. And as an adult, he fought with God, the angel of the Lord. And he was winning, but it was with weeping he asked the Lord for the blessing. He met God there. If you're weeping today and you're asking God to bless you, you're in a good place. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you've walked in the door limping, you're in a good place. If you walked in the door with a strut, if you really want to be with God, he'll break that. Let him. It's the best blessing in your life when God is in control like that. We're told Jacob moved forward on his journey, limping because of his hip. Limping because of his hip. So brothers and sisters, he was limping with God. God gave him a new name. His name was Jacob, which means chancer. His new name was Israel, which means triumphant with God. Not triumphant on his own strength, triumphant with God. This is so important. It should be the center core of our faith. With God, all things are possible. Amen. On my own strength, no. If you're going to face into whatever challenges you have next week and you're relying on your own strength or I'm relying on my own strength, we're not doing it the way God wants us to do it. This walk is all about relying on him. Amen? Amen. And so this is what we're called to do, brothers and sisters. Now, maybe your limp is a, a rejection from the past. That's a good limp to have. I, I felt my dad rejected me growing up. And you know, 
I don't know I would ever have become a Christian if I hadn't sensed that, because that started me searching. I knew there was something out. Maybe it's an addiction that's still like a shadow. You fought it off, but you know it's not far away. That's a good limb to have. Do you know why? Because you know every day you got to rely on Jesus. Amen. Every day. That's very healthy. That's really spiritually very healthy. Maybe it's a failure that still haunts you. There's all kinds of limps. But limps from God will bring life. To quote a contemporary pastor, Stephen Furtick, a little younger than myself even, he's over there in North Carolina, USA, he said the thing that causes us the most pain is often the very thing that produces the most power in our lives. What's your big pain? Perhaps God is saying, allow me to touch it, and that will bring you the greatest blessing in your life. So brothers and sisters, are you ready to shift up a gear? Because this is the sense we have prophetically, but it's personal now. We think it already started collectively, but now it's getting more personal. And God wants all of us to shift up a gear. Now, if you want to go from first gear into fifth gear, your car is going to stall. It's not going to happen. You can't do it all at once, but you do it one gear at a time. So if you've never driven, a car with a gear stick in it, that's how it works. It's one gear at a time. So some of us need to go from neutral to first or first to second. Here's a couple of examples. Have you been baptized by full immersion in water? If you love God and you've never done this, can I ask you to consider, we're gonna do it on Easter Sunday. What's that, six, seven weeks time? We're going to do it here and you can get baptized by water here if you are born again. That is an important step of identifying with Jesus. Have you spoken in tongues or filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Spirit? Some Christians will try and tell you tongues are not for today. Oh, yes, they are. It's called the full gospel. Do we really want to get the scissors out to so much of the Bible and pretend it's not there? Every Christian is called to speak in tongues. The Bible says, Paul said, I want you all to speak in tongues. Do not forbid the speaking in tongues. When we speak in tongues, the prayer language God gives us, we get an extra sense of strength. Hallelujah. Amen. If it hasn't happened to you, that's no shame. I don't mean it that way. But shift the gear. Ask God for it. Let go of the control. Amen. A lot of people struggle because they're not in control. You're not meant to be, not like that. Let God control it. Let God do it in you. Maybe it's the spiritual disciplines. You need to study the Bible more, pray more, fast more, come to church more often. All of the spiritual disciplines are there. Maybe it's relationships. You need to shift gear from hanging around with people who drag you down and hanging around with people who build you up. Are they life givers or life takers? Some people just take the energy from the room. They're just so negative. I don't want to hang around with someone who's going to gossip all day. Because you know what? They'll start by talking about you. And then they'll end when I leave the room talking about me. <laughs> don't hang around with people like that. You want to hang around with people who will build you up. Relationships. Lifestyle choices. You know, last night, if you walked around Cork, you'd have seen a load of people around 2, 3 a.m. Out of their heads with drugs, with drink. A Christian is not called to live like that. Would anyone give me a big amen? amen. That is not your calling. If you think it is, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Without fear of contradiction, you're wrong. Hate me if you want, but you're wrong. We're not called to live life like that. Make the right lifestyle choices. Move away from the choices that would destroy you and give God the glory. Amen. Give good choices. Spend your time with the people of God. Not like that. How about giving? Giving of your time, of your talent, of your treasure. Give. That's a good gear shift. Or to serve. Serve the Lord. Serve other people. Instead of about me, serve others. Maybe become a volunteer in some area that you enjoy, whether it's in the church or elsewhere. But serving others is a good gear shift. Or what about witnessing, telling others about Jesus? We live in a culture where you're not meant to talk about, what is it, money, politics, and faith. 
religion. Do you know what? I reject that. I think we need to have the freedom to talk about our faith. Are we going to let some politically correct guru restrict us from telling our family, our neighbours, our friends, our workmates about the change God has done in our lives? I say no. Can you say amen? amen. Don't let some politically correct media guru tell you you can't do it. Jesus said do it. And for many of us, I understand it takes a bit of courage. But just pray and say, God, I'm willing to shift the gear. Will you give me the opportunity so that I know? And when the opportunity comes up, I will have the courage to open my mouth. And you might say to me, I don't know what to say. You know what the Bible says? God will give you the words. Amen. He'll give you the words. Yeah. It's, it's not complicated. Just take a step of faith and believe. Finally, the first one it should be really, salvation. Maybe you're in neutral gear. Like I said, you've started the engine. That's why you're here. The next step is to go from neutral into first gear. Just with every eye closed. If you've never got into first gear, or maybe you were in gear in the past and you've drifted back into neutral. If you've never asked the Lord into your life or if you want to reconnect with him again, with nobody looking, all I can see are shadows. Could you slip a hand up to show God that you're reaching out to him here and now? See your hand, your hand. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, I think we have nine people who've uh, put up their hands to invite the Lord in for the first time, or maybe you're reconnecting. This is a salvation prayer. Even if you've drifted, you need to get right with God again. Amen? So I'm going to ask that we'd all pray this. Can you say it after me? It's up on the screen if you just repeat it after me. But particularly, the nine of you who've put up your hands. Don't leave here without saying this and saying it from your heart. Let's all say it together. Are you, are you up for that? Yes. We ready? Okay. Lord Jesus Christ, I invite you into my life, into my heart and my future. Forgive me all my sins. I turn from them. I surrender to you. Can I ask everyone, just lift up your two hands for a second, but particularly the nine people. Let's say it again, I surrender, to you. I surrender to you. Thank you, you can take them down again. It's just to help those guys. I ask you to be my leader, I ask you to be my, leader. my savior, I my friend. My friend. Change, my heart, Change my heart, Lord, and help me to become, help me become more like you. More like you. I want to follow you. All the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. We give those nine guys a round of applause. God bless you. God has such a future for you. Hallelujah. I want to pray for those who've known the wound and you know that God put your hip out of joint. You know what? We need to thank God for that. And I'm not going to pray for those who haven't had it because it's a tough prayer. But I want you to observe that there are a load of people here who know it and they thank God for it because it makes them a better, stronger, long-lasting Christian. So if you know that God has wounded you and you're okay with that because here you are all those years or all those minutes later still walking with a limp, would you lift up your hand? You've got to own this. You know God has, in a wonderful way, wounded you. Okay, I'm going to ask you, would you put one hand on your hip and lift the other hand up high to the Lord? We thank you, Lord, for the wound you have given us. Can you say amen to that? And we thank you, Lord, that even though we limp, we know if we didn't have this limp, we wouldn't be in a good place. So we praise you here at Grace Church, McCurtain Street, Cork, for the limp you have given us. And we pray, God, that we would continue, like Jacob, to move forward on our journey, 
this pilgrimage through life and that we would be life-giving everywhere we go. Thank you, Lord. You have taken the strut away from us. And with this limp, we will follow you because it's a blessed limp. So thank you here and now, God. Use us greatly and help us to truly honor the name of Christian because it gives honor to you. In Jesus' name and God's people said. <laughs>